Well, okay, guys, we're in week two of our series on Revelation. Uh, I took the liberty of giving you a handout. I hope you have it. Um, The backside of it was last week's handout. My hope was that it would just kind of catch you up. Um, Those of you that are completely new to the series, I'm going to do my very best to kind of catch you up to the best of my ability and explain it in a way that doesn't drag on for an hour and a half and kind of gets you uh, all on the same page. High level, what we believe is is happening in the book of Revelation is the Apostle John, the youngest of the disciples of Jesus. Uh, He's the last man standing, the last one living. Uh, Tertullian, who was a a Christian uh, writer and historian, wrote in about 160 A.D. um, that it was widely known about this one moment in uh, the disciple John's life when he was roughly in his 60s at this point, mid-60s, uh, he was taken to the Colosseum. It was Emperor Domitian's um, desire at that point to snuff out the last living member of, of the disciples of Jesus of the original crew. And so, as Tertullian tells us, it was widely known and discussed at that point that uh, the disciple John was put in a vat of oil that was meant to boil him alive. He kept preaching Jesus and the gospel of Jesus and the 10,000 people that were there uh, who were there to watch someone be executed noticed that nothing was happening. And uh, at that point, 10,000 people converted to Jesus and then Rome's problem grew 10,000 fold. And so what they said is, we can't deal with this guy. We're sending him to the island of Patmos. Patmos is an island off of present day Turkey. And that's when he writes the book of Revelation, okay? And he would stay exiled because they couldn't kill him uh, until Domitian was no longer in power, and then Rome let him come back uh, to live out his days, and he died of old age, the only one to do so. He wrote this letter in that it is meant to be written in code. And the reason is, is the early church uh, was absolutely getting hammered by the Roman Empire, Uh, There was all kinds of stuff that they would do to weed out Christians. Um, They would have you, before you could sell in the Agora or the open market back then, or before they would start a city council meeting, uh, in every every level that you could think of, they would have you burn incense to the Roman gods. This was a brilliant way of separating out Christians from non-Christians, because Christians wouldn't do it. And at that point, they knew what you were. And sometimes it just meant that you'd lose your job. Sometimes it meant you would take a beating. And sometimes it would cost you your life. And so as time went on, Roman culture, Roman society, Roman ideals were a certain kind of thinking. And Christianity early on was seen as opposition to that. Okay? The whole thing about what they were about became highly problematic. And so there's a ton of writings, even if you don't Believe in Jesus, let's say. There's all kinds of of correspondences that went on between the Roman Empire that we have to this day. One is from Pliny, uh, actually uh, discussing to kind of a younger subordinate about what was going on with this Christus group. And and they refer to them as a contagion, ironically, after just going through COVID. They were actually seen as the very first kind of pandemic was these followers named Jesus. And don't, don't get too close to them because it might spread, you know? So this was the way that they thought early on, and Christians were seen as highly problematic to the Roman society and culture. So he's writing this letter to encourage them under extreme persecution that God wins. God wins. And he wrote it in a way that's in code. Now you have to understand something. Jesus is Jewish. The disciples are Jewish. The early church, believe it or not, up until 70 AD, all Jewish, okay? It didn't start becoming what you think of it today until post-70 AD. So they all were steeped in the Old Testament. Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, like all these books that we, we don't really read that deeply in the Christian church, they knew them, like knew them, knew them. And so this is written using numbers and symbolism rooted in the Old Testament on purpose, So that if it fell into Roman hands, they would pick up the letter and they would do what most of us do in present day Christianity. What on earth are all these weird animals, numbers, in the same way that it hits you like, huh? That was the idea. 
<laughs> only meant to do that to the Roman Empire if they ever got a hold of it. So it's actually written in code. And again, like I said, it's using symbolism that made all the sense in the world to them. Okay? If I said that, if I described a nation as the Uncle Sam's, you know what the Uncle Sam's would be. Immediately. I just described Uncle Sam in an image, you're like, oh, that's America, right? If I was like, hammer and sickle, you know what that is, right? But 2,000 years from now, they may be like, what? So there's a lot of that disconnect, right? Like we said, what city am I talking about? Okay, they have the, the feet of a maverick, right? The body of a cowboy and the head of a ranger, right? It's a city that perpetually loses, right? And you know what that is immediately, so you know. So that's what's happening. The colors mean something to them. The numbers mean something to them, and it's all rooted in this, this ancient, <clears throat> in their, their history that they're standing upon. So that's high level. It's also in three camera angles. You know how you watch a basketball game, football game, box match, whatever, okay? And they show you a great play, and you see it from one angle, and whether you even realize it or not, then they cut to the next angle, and the player's running towards you. And they cut to the next angle, and it's a bird's eye view. And they cut the next angle, and it's back behind the line of scrimmage. And you see it from three different angles, you know? You, you take that kind of information in all the time. Well, that's how Revelation is written. It's describing the same event from three different camera angles. It's not written in linear, okay? And so I hope that that'll help also kind of free up your mind a little bit about why it feels like you're repeating things, okay? Another example that you may be familiar with that's written in that way is in Genesis. The first part of Genesis in chapter 1 and 2 is about what was created. And that's a camera angle. Boom. And then if you've noticed when you read Genesis in a linear way, you're like, wait a minute, we're back to the thing that we just read. Well, he describes the first time what was created. Then the next camera angle is who was created. And he's describing the same event. They don't have PowerPoint. They don't have cool stuff to work with. You just had to read, you know, and <laughs> get it in your head. So that's kind of what's happening. And what you're going to find, if you haven't already started to catch it, it's actually meant to bring you great peace and comfort and confidence. But it is striking how, like, how much it speaks to our world today. So look at the side that's Revelation 6 and 7 and Revelation 8, 9, 10, and 11. And I'm going to break this down for you. Uh, and then we're going to read one part of Scripture, and I'll explain that. You're going to see a thing that's one camera view, and it talks about the seals. And so this way, if you read it on your own, you just it'll make sense. All of these colors meant something to them, okay? Now, the seals, what, what are we talking about when we talk about seals? We are talking about in this first camera angle what man will do to man. That's the seals, what man will do to man, okay? So what we see is the first seal is a white horse. Those in power will turn on their own people. This, this was not written last week, okay? Those in power will turn on their people. As people ascend to power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what he says. That's the first thing you're going to start to notice. And he says, well, then there's a red horse. Is the heart of people will turn on one another. As the pressure gets turned up and those in power begin to press and push and you have to divide in order to conquer, that's a necessity. That's 5,000 years old, that tactic. And as you press, the pressure and the stress upon people is the red horse of bloodshed. They will turn on each other. And if that's not enough, comes the black horse. <laughs> Go figure. Inflation. I'm old enough to remember handing someone a $20 bill and filling up my 68 Impala when I was 17. $20 bought me 20 gallons. Can you even fathom that right now? That will never happen again. Those of you that are like 65 and older, right? You bought a house, a whole house with like 
some grapefruit and a banana. And they're like, here's a house. You know, that was it. That's all you needed. You were good. You know, you bought awesome cars made of steel. Okay. And they were like four digits. Think of all the things of what they used to cost. If you've ever looked at just home prices pre-COVID. And they're not coming back down. It's not going to stop. We only notice it because it just took a steep jump, right? But it, w it won't come back. Not really. Even when we, we had a school, we used to talk about you have to increase things by 3%. I mean, this whole model, it's every business that's running constantly has to go up a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You witness that and have experienced that in every aspect of your life. Then there's the pale horse. Annihilation. Why? Can't afford to live. And that disparity about who can afford to live and who can feed their family and who can't begins to take its toll all over the world. I was watching kids in Haiti. And kids in Haiti, they'll eat cookies that have fat mixed into the mud and they're basically made of mud with fat mixed in. That's what they eat. Annihilation. Starvation. And then comes martyrdom. Nero was horrific. Domitian was hor horrific. This goes all the way through uh, all the way probably the first 300 years of Christianity. This is uh, all of the different methods that were used to separate families and break the backs of Christians and demoralize them. Christians were used sometimes for sport, sometimes for entertainment in the Colosseum as animals tore them apart. It's interesting because probably the first time anyone ever wore a cross around their neck was after the last person who ever saw anyone hang on one was dead. Because that's, a, that's an instrument of death. It means something very different to us today. Understand? I, I get that. And good for you if you're wearing one. I'm, not, you know, I'm just saying there was a period of, of 300 years where this was really, really, really bad. What they did to Christians, it did to Christian families. And so there's this idea of Christians being persecuted. Then there's tribulation. And it's this idea that, that Jesus will come back and every knee will bow, right? Now, this is where things split. And let me just say, it's okay if you don't agree with me on this. It's okay, all right? It's not worth a food fight at Thanksgiving. It's not. And you could read this and you're like, no, Josh, I believe in a tribulation. You know what? I love the idea of, your, of the tribulation. If that's the side that you're on, I would love to be beamed up and avoid all the heartache. I'm down. Okay, I'm in. If that works out, great. If not, you're going to stay on this planet and suffer with me. Okay, that's the only two ways this is going to go. Okay, so there are two other views that I don't have represented in here. One was uh, like the future view, they call it, where it's future, it's all going to come in the future, nothing has happened yet, nothing is kicked off, okay? Then there was another view called the preterist view, which was relevant for a while, but that even kind of said like it's all already happened, okay? So those have, have kind of been discounted. The two biggies are the Western view, and the Western view kind of makes uh, this, the, the, the book of Revelation very Western civilization centric. That's where the Left Behind series and the rapture, um, that's where you see like the Jewish state of May 8, 1948 becomes really relevant in the discussion, okay, of end times prophecy. Um, and it's this idea that, that we're raptured in seven years of tribulation and then God will reign for a thousand, okay? Now, I, I, I hold to what would be called the Hebrew view, which is basically this. This is a letter written to first century Christians to encourage them that has application to my life and my country and my world and everything in it today. But I would not say it was written for the United States. 
I would, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, that's not what he was, he's writing to first century Christians under persecution. It is applicable to my life. It's applicable to my country. It's relevant to all of it, okay? And this is a different view that if you read Joel 2.28, that Joel is pouring out to this end times kicking off when God pours out his spirit. And that's when I would look at Acts chapter 2.17. And that's at Pentecost when God's spirit is poured out. And there you have it, okay? So that's the Hebrew view. And of course, I have kind of a description there for you as well. And then the seventh seal is silence. And that's interesting because there's this brief period of silence. And in Scripture and throughout time, when God is silent, right on the other side of that is when He does some of His most amazing work. That's really important. God is silent for over 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the birth of Jesus. There's always a period of silence. Jesus dies on the cross, silence. So the silence portion isn't God not caring. It means that the next amazing thing he's going to do is about to hit. Now what I want you to know, what's interesting, is there's these three camera views, and on the sixth of each one that we're going to look at is also when Satan is released to run wild. Demonic forces run wild. And that's relevant because of the three camera angles of the three camera angles of, of, of each group. It falls on the number six. Six, six, six. The number for Satan. Okay? Now when we look at, push forward to Revelation 8, 9, 10, and 11. Now we're going to look at the trumpets. So first what we saw was what man does to man. The next now we're going to look at is what uh, nature does to man. You with me? Man does to man. Now it's the next camera angle of the same period is nature to man. You know it as global warming. But it's called global warning. See? So when things start to blow up and a tsunami hits this part of the world and there's this fire, forest fire over here and this seems to be like the earth is starting to turn on its own people. See? And that's the second camera angle we're going to look at is, is the trumpets. And this is a lot of fascinating, cryptic, crazy stuff that he starts to describe. Hail and fire coming down. A third of the earth being burned up. This is relevant, the idea of a third. The reason why everything is a third in this section is it's about restraint. You go, how's that restraint? Because he didn't destroy the other two-thirds. That's why, right? It's a, a third measure of getting your attention. So a third of it will be destroyed. And you'll go, that's horrible. And he's allowing a third of it to be destroyed so people will wake up. That's how God always gets his people's attention, gets their priorities straight. Things get real clear with people when their surroundings have been decimated, for better or for worse. For some reason, that's just the genetic code in all of us. When it's really good, we think it's about us, we think we're awesome, and we lose sight of where it all came from. When it's all taken from us, suddenly our list of everything we want in our life gets really clear. You ever notice that? Somebody who's healthy, they have a hundred things they want for their future. A person has cancer, they have exactly one thing on their list. You know what it is? I don't want cancer. Super clear. So this is what ends up happening here in this whole idea. Is it's a third. It's restraint. Mountain explodes. Sea and ships are burned up. A meteor. Rivers turn to bitter and poisonous to the taste. Some of the language used in this portion of Scripture is where we get the idea of Chernobyl. And then there's a warning. You'll see whenever you read this, if you, if you read it on your own, which I'd encourage you to do. This is a warning. And then there's a, a fifth trumpet. And this is where you start seeing between the fifth and the sixth is the ushering in of these creatures that run wild on the earth. I, I hope I don't have to convince you that evil is real. Demonic forces are real. It, it's always harder to convince people that God is real, ironically. 
But I've never had to sell anyone on the idea that evil is real. They usually are like, yep, they're good with that idea. And so it's this whole idea that within the fifth and the sixth trumpet, we start seeing this bizarre presence moving in and over and influencing people. Influencing the way they think. Influencing the way that they act. You see things that to you hit you as like, wow, that's evil. That's odd. What makes people do that? Well, don't get it twisted. This whole thing is happening, moving in and around human beings all the time. Running roughshod over people. Then you see the sixth trumpet is the last battle. Satan himself has the green light. And then, of course, you'll see the angel and the little scroll, which we'll look at in just a second, and the witnesses. And then finally, the seventh trumpet. So, with that in mind, to get us out of here sooner than I did last week, let's check out the scripture here. Because what's interesting is in each section, after the sixth, okay, and we're going to look at the seven bowls next week, okay, um, there's always like this interlude period. There's silence. And in this case, in Revelation 10 and 11, they get up to the sixth, the sixth trumpet, and then their 10 and 11 is like this funky interlude, and then it picks back up with the seventh trumpet. Now, let me say before we read this, if you're confused, that's okay. If you want to email me, that's okay, all right? If you hate something that you're hearing, that's okay, um... You should see some of the emails I get sometimes. They're fantastic, okay? So I want you to just know that if you want to join us at any of the Bible studies we have during the week because you got more questions, you want to grill me, or if you have questions you want to hit me up on social media or, or via email, just send them my way, okay? Now, here is this interlude period between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, and I'll explain some of this as we close out our time together. This is the angel in the little scroll. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Now, this is probably Malach Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh in the Old Testament. What's, what's that reference? Malach Yahweh at this point, right? It's a messenger of Yahweh. That's the second person of the Trinity. It's the image of Jesus. Coming down from heaven, he was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like a roar of a lion. Then he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go, take the scroll that lies open, in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now, in the Greek, you must prophesy again about could also be rendered to, share with, proclaim to, okay? Many other peoples, nations. So what's the little scroll? What's all this madness? The little scroll is what's in the pews in front of you. Back in the day, there's no book, there's no Bible, it's all a scroll. The little scroll that human eyes can look upon is God's Word, written in the front and the back. And what he's saying is that you're to consume Scripture. Consume it. 
But there's this odd reality of sour and sweet. You think, okay, what's up with the sour and the sweet? Well, the sour is God's will, intent, design, law. How he wants us to live and function puts a sour taste in our mouths and in our stomachs. And you may be hearing me and going, no, I don't feel that way. Well, let's try, okay? So what would be God's will, intent, and design, okay? Here we go. Cheating on your spouse is wrong. God's heart, will, intent, and design, right? Berating your kids at a baseball game because they're seven and miss the throw to first base is wrong, right? Uh, watching porn is wrong. Getting high and drunk is wrong. Getting on social media, spacing out from everyone around you and having envy take over your life because you want the highlight reel of someone else rather than the life that you were given is wrong. Racism is wrong. Slavery is wrong. Trans surgery on kids is wrong. Abortion is wrong. Gay marriage is wrong. Feeling anything in your stomach yet? Like, I wish I could leave this church right now. I don't like this person. Don't spin the camera of me even sitting in here because HR is going to ask me questions on Monday. Why are you listening to this lunatic? Now, here's what I said. I said a bunch of things to you that sound political. Right? Under the thumb, right, of the Roman Empire. And I could keep going, and, and don't, make, don't get it twisted, because I know some of us have had experiences with the fire and brimstone, right, where like the holier than righteous pastor that, is, that descended down from heaven to talk to his subjects, right, for an hour. Please, please know, I'm right in the midst of all the mess, the swamp and the funk, right there with you, okay? If I could be real, most of the time I stand up here and I'm like, I have no business being up here. And when I think I'm awesome, sometimes the lady on the front row will remind me, you're not that awesome. So no matter what, I get checked, okay? And I just want you to know that God's will, intent, and design, whether it's what you physically have done, actually have said, have thought in your heart, all of it, believe it or not, his righteousness is so perfect, he doesn't differentiate. So even if you didn't do ba 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 right, but your heart and your mind are cold and dark, he doesn't care. It's a foul stench to him. And I'm right in the pack with you. Okay, so it's not judging you to me. I'm just telling you, you see what that feels like. It's the sense that there's no way to give Jesus enough of a makeover so that culture will finally like him. Maybe if we dress him up nice enough, maybe the culture will like him. You will always be counterculture as a follower of Jesus. Your views, if you take all all of Scripture seriously will never fit cleanly in any political party. It will never happen. You can't. So it's this feeling that you're out of step, this sour feeling that either you feel, ugh, or that the people around you are going to reject you. You know the sour feeling when a conversation goes there and you know you need to say the name Jesus and your mouth gets dry, your tongue gets big, you feel weird in your stomach, and instead of saying Jesus, you say God or church. Right? Because we've all been there. I went into a gas station one time. I just wanted to get gas, because I had things I needed to do, and a woman was behind the register saying, uh, told somebody to, you know, basically to go to hell. That's what she said. And then she looked at me and hung up the phone as I'm paying and goes, do you want to go to hell with me? I'm not making this up. And you want to know what I did? Pastor, Christian, follower of Jesus, she put it out on a platter for me. Do you want to go to hell with me? You know what I said? Thanks for the invite, but no thanks. $12 of pump seven. Like, that's what I did. That's this. That's I'm being fed that it's all good, but I know if I go against it, no one will like me. 
That's sour. So what's sweet? After the sour hits, what's sweet is the beautiful grace of God given to failures, given to people with a past, given to people who have messed up, have done really, really dark things, and have thought and said really, really shameful things. And they know in their heart of hearts they don't deserve the sweet taste of God's love and grace and mercy and acceptance. And yet He gives it to them anyways. Just because they have the faith of a child. That's it. Scandalous. Unearned. Unmerited. Given to people. Just simply in faith, hope, and trust. So there's this funk, right? And then he goes on to say this. In 11.1, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months and I will appoint my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1260 days and clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain down, rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony... The beast that comes from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each, of each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. And the seventh trumpet, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead. And the rewarding your event, your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. The two witnesses is your worship and your witness. Your worship and your witness. Your worship is how you live out your life, not whether or not you're in church or not. How your life is lived out daily in your rhythm with God. Yes, being here, great. But it's the other six days a week as well, six and a half. That's your worship to God. When you go to your job, that's your worship to your God. When you're home with your family, that's your worship to God. All of it. And your witness are the things that actually come out of your face to another person who doesn't know who Jesus is. It's what you actually say. Worship without witness is being really nice to your neighbor. That's awesome. But that's not the same thing as witness. It's not. Worship and witness, both and, have to happen. 
And he's saying that as this is happening, the world will look down on people who live this way and speak this way. They'll take advantage of them. They'll try to hurt and crush them. And they'll enjoy their pain. But then he transitions. And the transition is that God has a point when his kids are crying out to him where he finally says, that's enough. And just as God has done for thousands of years, he finally steps in. Maybe you've had that experience, those of you that had a dad, or maybe you mouthed off at mom and you took it a little too far and dad finally reminded you, don't ever talk to my wife that way ever again. I, th I think me and all my siblings got that warning, okay? And that's a weird moment when you realize, like, that's enough. Don't cross the line. There it is. It's the same thing for you as the bride of Christ. You're the bride. And there's a point where God finally goes, nope, no more. Venge vengefulness, wrath, that's mine. I got it. And so he's painting that picture of God finally stepping in. And it becomes to a point that by the end, what you see is that every knee will bow or every knee will bow. That's the option that the world will finally have. They have an option. You can either bow or you can bow. Which one would you like? And he's painting a picture to encourage not only the people in the first century, but you as well in your current sufferings and hardship and pain, that God sees it. He didn't start the world spinning and walk away. He's aware of the hardships that you're in. He's aware of the difficulties that you've had in your life. It's not lost on him at times when you feel lonely, lonely and afraid, when you feel beaten up in your life, when you feel like you haven't had a shot or a chance or this person's sick and no, no sooner do they get better, now you have this. He's aware of all of it. He's aware of the business deals where you're taken advantage of. He's aware of the people in your life who've stabbed you in the back. He's aware of the people who have mistreated you or took advantage of some part of your heart in a relationship. He sees it all. And it's not that he doesn't care. There's a point when he finally steps in and makes every wrong right. In the end, God wins. Amen? Amen.